So I'm going to just jump straight in. Uh, my name's Dean. Uh, I helped co-found this organisation about three years ago. I've just moved from Melbourne, so please come and say hello. I'm still wanting new friends in Sydney. Um, I, I previously, in a different life, was a neuroscientist down in Melbourne, and now I've moved and um, am a psychologist here in Sydney. Um, I'm going to talk to you today and give you a sort of uh, an overview of how LSD actually affects your brain and what that means for our consciousness. So, I know there's a clicker here. Here we go. So I'm going to start off with a quote from Aldous Huxley, who I'm sure we're all familiar with. Uh, Each one of us is potentially mind at large, but insofar as we are animals, our business is at all costs to survive. To make biological survival possible, mind at large has to be funneled through the reducing valve of the brain and nervous system. What comes out the other end is a measly trickle of what kind of consciousness uh, of the kind of consciousness which will help us stay alive on the surface of this particular planet. So if we bring this forward into neuroscientific terms, there's a man by the name of Carl Friston who actually uh, created some very influential uh, types of fMRI uh, imaging techniques um, and also theories around how we make decisions in, uh, within the brain as well. And it very much matches on to what Aldous Huxley was trying to tell us about the uh, reducing valve. So Carl Friston talks about this, the free energy principle. And basically what this means is our brain is made to recognize patterns in the world. Our brain is, is designed to reduce the amount of energy that we expend to make our way through the world in a functional manner. Uh, this means reducing the amount of energy that we expend. So our brain takes up about 30% of all the energy that we use. Um, and if we didn't have this sort of reducing valve on our brain, there would be a lot more energy expended trying to navigate the world. So basically, the idea of the free energy principle is, is based off thermodynamic principles, whereby we're actually trying to reduce the amount of entropy or energy that we expend through navigating the world. Um, and this can be uh, through, we, we see this in psychology through the terms of auto automatization or schematization. So this is the idea where we start to, through our experiences, where we see the same things occurring predictably, we start to create schemas of, of those patterns in nature. So you'll know that when you twist a door handle, you will be able to pull the door open. This is just a predictable automatic response that we expect in our brain every time we do this. Um, and so this is reflected within our brain uh, through the process of pruning. So basically what that means is we have these two really critical periods throughout our uh, childhood and adolescent life where we've actually got trillions of connections between different neurons in the brain that are being pruned. And these are pruned to reflect our experience in the world. So every time we have an experience, it strengthens the connections that represent that experience between neurons. And every time a neuron, a connection between neurons doesn't get used, it actually gets a little bit weaker and we eventually are just cutting off all the information we don't need in our brain and our brains are becoming more rigid because of that and we're only in that and because of that we're starting to filter the information that we see in the world so this is our brain when we're at rest each one of these little circles around the outside represents a different node in the brain and each one of these lines represents a connection between those nodes that's your brain at rest. That's your brain on psychedelics. So basically what you're seeing is that there is, there's no more activation of the different areas, but there's an increase in the number of connections between the areas. So we're not inventing new areas, but what we are doing is we're inventing new connections between them. And if you think about what this means and what I've just told you, it's actually reducing that patterned way of thinking. You know, we're, not, we're removing those filters that we once had. Um, and so this is akin to removing the reducing valve that Aldous Huxley was just talking about and increasing greater connectivity is what we call it in neuroscientific terms within fMRI. Uh, and so it connects areas which don't normally talk to each other. So th if you think about your experience, you might think of some of the perceptual changes that you get uh, or some of the synesthesia that you might experience where you start to feel colours or see emotions or you know, 
there, there is music that just connects to you in a deeper way than what it would before. This is different novel areas in your brain talking to each other. And so this is referred to as effects on higher ordered way of thinking. Um, and once again, it sort of reduces those filters in the patterns that we look at the world. And that's akin, if we think about what I just talked about, how through our childhood and adolescence, we're pruning the connections between our brains to represent those patterns. We're trying to reverse that a little bit with psychedelics. We're actually seeing that where our, our brain is becoming a little bit more childlike when we take psychedelics. Um, so this is represented, the actual conscious state associated with psychedelics has been sort of put forward, a big proponent by um, Robin Carhart Harris, which is part of David Nutt's lab uh, over in the Imperial College London. He, he, he likes to think of consciousness as this spectrum. And so within this spectrum we have uh, lower end or subcritical consciousness or reduced consciousness, and you can think of states like sleep, coma, uh, when you're under anesthesia, you've taken benzos maybe. They're all different levels of unconsciousness. And then as you move up, you move up to what we have is our normal waking level of consciousness here. And so it's still quite rigid. You're still seeing patterns in the world. You're filtering the information through those schemas, all those patterns. Uh, and, and it's reducing the amount of information you have to process to navigate the world. Then you add psychedelics, and it just, bit by bit, in a dose-dependent manner, increases the amount of entropy that we have in how we navigate the world. It reduces those filters and increases the amount of information that's allowed to come into the way we look at the world. And, and this is what we call as, you know, depending on the dose that you take, if you take a mild dose, you can reach what they, what Robin Kaha Harris likes to call this criticality uh, spot, where you're actually able to change your rigid ways of thinking and start thinking at thing, things without your perceptual filters, and maybe start to think of things in this novel way, and that might lead to this sort of creative mind that people are thinking with psychedelics. It also enables you to step back, uh, and this is what could make it very therapeutic as well, with people who have these very rigid... Uh, dysfunctional thought patterns like people with anxiety disorders or depressive disorders who have really negative rigid ways of thinking and then you know as you increase the dose you can get up to this level and if you think about having a flood dose of uh, 5 meo DMT or buforvarius or any psychedelic where you take a large amount you eventually just obliterate yourself and have this ego dissolution we are unaware of who you are or even the world that you're in and that's this super critical state of consciousness. And so how does LSD actually increase entropy in the brain? Well, there's two primary methods. Uh, Vince mentioned the serotonin 2A receptor. I'm not going to go into the detail of receptors because it gets a bit messy and I don't think we still know enough. Um, but I'm going to talk from the system level. And what we do know is that there's a decrease in sensory gating. I'll explain that in a little bit. And that there's a disintegration of the default mode network. Um, but I will say one thing is that we know that both of these systems are mediated by the serotonin 2A receptor. We know that's important. And we know that's important because both times what we do is we give them a drug that specifically blocks that receptor or antagonizes that receptor and we get rid of the psychedelic state. And when we get rid of the psychedelic state, we also block some of these changes that I'm going to talk to you about. So just, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. The serotonin 2A receptor is important, but it's not the only receptor. Um, and I'll talk to you about the more systemic uh, approaches. So what I talk about when I'm talking about sensory gating, there's these areas in the brain uh, that form a loop where basically sensory information is taken up and, and actually come you know, through the brainstem, it reaches these midbrain areas within the thalamus, ventral striatum, and they project into the cortex, so these outer areas, the sort of areas that were later to evolve. And that's where we have the more conscious processing of sensory information. That's when we start to make sense of the sensory inputs that come up. But they also feed back on each other. So they call this the cortico-thalamo-striatal cortical feedback loop, so let's just call it CTSC. Um, and let's not get into too much detail, but basically the whole purpose of this loop is to mediate interoceptive and exteroceptive information, sensory information. So 
your, your, your sensory information of what's happening, what's coming through your senses from the outside world, and also the senses of what's happening inside your body. You know, that's a whole other level of sensory perception that we have. And through this loop, we're able to perceive it through the midbrain, project it out here for conscious processing, and then back through the midbrain down to your body where you're governing your decision making and how you're going to actually act on that information. Um, and what we see is that there's actually decreased feedback in this loop. So all this information is getting fed through the thalamus up into the cortical areas, but there's no actual feedback. So we're just flooding our conscious brain with information when we take psychedelics, and there's no feedback that's stopping that. And, and so eventually we're just increasing and flooding with the information. If you take enough psychedelics, you're just going to be overloaded. And that's the ego dissolution state that so many people are familiar with when they take a high dose. Um, so this was a very recent study. This actually came out this year. So it's very new information and it's kind of exciting to see where this is going to go. Um, and if you think about this uh, from what I've just said, like this, this lack of feedback, it can almost be seen as when we're at our normal state of consciousness, what we're doing is we have a normal amount of information and it's feeding back from our you know, our conscious way of filtering information, our patterned ways of filtering information through our sort of cortex, and that feeds back how we decide how we view that sensory information. Our patterns are located up here, you know, our, our patterned ways of thinking are filtered through there. If it can't feed back, we remove those patterns and we end up flooding, opening the floodgates of our perception. And once again, think about that through the analogy that Aldous Huxley talked about, where we're removing the reducing valve uh, of our brain. The other primary mechanism that we know about psychedelics uh, and LSD as well is that as entropy increases, as we increase this flood of information into the cortex, we actually disintegrate three key areas in our brain that operate as one, and this is the default mode network. Has anyone heard of the default mode network? Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of an explanation. Basically, this is an area of the brain which is thought to help with uh, self-perception or the perception of yourself uh, in the world. Uh, so maybe you're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow, what your plans are for the future, how you looked in front of that person when you were just in that situation before. Did you say something stupid or silly? You know, it's your self-consciousness in past, present and future contexts. And this is the opposite of what we call the task positive network. And basically that is when you're engaged in a task and you're doing something but you're not thinking of, of yourself, you're not self-conscious, you're just involved in it, I guess the peak level of that would be a flow state. So you're not aware of yourself, you're just one with the activity that you're doing. These, have, these are anti-correlated. So uh, as the default mode network uh, becomes de uh, desensitized, the task positive network actually increases in connectivity and vice versa. And what we see is that with increases in psychedelics and entropy, we actually dissolve uh, the default mode network. And this is associated with level unconstrained cognition, um, so more, less filters on your perception is another way of saying that, um, increased levels of flow states, which I'm sure a lot of people here could um, relate to and a reduced sense of ego-boundedness. So less related to your body, more related to the world around you, uh, less, less constrained by your self-perceptions. And if you take enough of the psychedelic, you'll get those states of oceanic boundlessness. So then, what happens the day after? Because equally as important is not what happens during the trip, but what happens after the trip. So we know that the day after psychedelics, there's actually this rebound effect within the default mode network. So we see this increase in self-perception. We see this increase in planning for the future. And this could be thought of as the sort of integration aspect that occurs along psychedelics. Because when you take in a psychedelic, it's not a functional state to be in for an extended period of time, right? You know, you can't go, go to work and, and think about and plan and do maths and, and sit in meetings that you would consider boring and uncreative otherwise, you know? So, it actually opens the doors of your perception, enables you to see things without your filter, but then the day afterwards we see a rebound effect where we're like, okay, what do I do with all this new information? Now that I've seen the world in this way, what do I do? You've got to start integrating it back in your sense of self. 
And that's what happens the day afterwards, where you see this sort of reset-like effect, where you've hit the reset button on your brain and you can now start to integrate this information in how you're going to act into the future, how you're going to think about yourself. And this is where a lot of the therapeutic effects are thought to come from, is how people can reset their brain from these rigid thought patterns. Um, and this is reflected in what we know about the sort of plasticity effects in the brain as well. So uh, we talked about pruning earlier on. Uh, and so that's cutting the connections between neurons that don't normally talk to each other. You know, it reduces the amount of energy we have to expend to keep these connections together. The opposite of this, when you take a psychedelic, you actually see an increase in three types of plasticity. So neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, and spinogenesis. Essentially, what all that's saying is that you're increasing the amount of connections between neurons. And that means you're actually reversing this pruning effect. Uh, it's not going to reverse it to the extent that you've been pruned already, like a child, but enough to help establish new ways of thinking about the world. And this is also a very recent study as well, just come out last year, and it was shown with uh, a variety of psychedelic substances, including thenethylamine-based substances, DMT and LSD. Uh, so just to summarise what I've told you, the brain is designed as it is to constrain your perception, to filter the patterns, uh, filter the information you see to make it manageable uh, so you don't waste too much energy. Um, LSD does the opposite of this. It increases the energy expended or the entropy. It opens up the reducing valve on your perception and increases the connectivity between brain areas that don't normally talk to each other. This decreases sensory gating through the CTSC feedback loop, so it opens those floodgates. It also deactivates the default mode work network or your sense of self in future planning. Uh, and then your brain adapts and it responds and it, and it actually increases uh, your self-perception the day after and enables you to reintegrate this new information into your daily life and help you understand how you might act in the world a bit better. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. So we might do questions for both Vince and I together now. So we've probably got about 15 minutes for questions. Yep. Do you want to... I'm just going to put something in the background. I don't know of any research about that. I just don't know. Sorry. Do you know, Dean? I didn't hear the question. Sorry. Can psychedelics affect epigenetics? Epigenetics. I haven't seen any studies done on epigenetics. What's epigenetics? So epigenetics is. Do you want to test that one out? So epigenetics is basically any change that can occur in your genome based on environmental influences. Um, and there are a few different ways that that occurs. Um, histone, deacetylase and methyltransferase are probably the primary methods. But the you know, psychedelic fields are so early, we're not even at the stage of understanding how they interact with our genome, let alone uh, interact with um, how they actually affect the genome itself. research in Australia is starting this month down in Melbourne at St. Vincent's Hospital there um, using psilocybin for end of life anxiety and I think it's a really, you know, strategically it's a smart type of study to start doing because it's much harder to object to the risks in people who are already terminally ill but it's also I think really important work and, and can genuinely make a difference in people with anxiety at that time. Yeah, down the front. What do you think of using psychedelics with cancer? Uh, what do we think about using psychedelics with cancer? Well, you've got cancer, then you go through cancer, you've got parents. Yeah. For what aim? Um, just to keep happy. Well, that's, that's what I do, just, just to keep a 
indicate positive. That's exactly the, what Vince was just talking about. This study is actually looking in, so at St. Vincent's, the first full on clinical trial. Yeah, because this time last year, I, I, I can't come to the revision now. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. Welcome. I'm glad that you came through. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, this, that's, that's probably the other, some of the first clinical trials done. Um, um, and get some in, in the so published studies. They were some no, of the, published. no, I'm talking about the published studies. They were, they were some of the first published studies done with psychedelics uh, in a clinical trial, and that's actually the first one that's going to be done here in Australia, and it's recruiting this year. And, and basically what they show is, as you've probably experienced, which we can talk about after if you want, is um, that they, uh, it helps to ameliorate the sort of existential anxiety associated with death. So yeah, very promising studies. Down the back. Task positive network. Task positive network. Um, I was just wondering if you know this has any relation to set and setting. So you know you were saying that they both come to indicate it. Is that right? They sort of come to each other. So yeah. So when one is activated, the other isn't. Yeah. Yes. So if you sort of go into psychedelics with that intention, does that does that help with the the TK? So when you're going into a psychedelic experience and you're setting an intention, are you saying that, is, is that related to? Does that help, you know, like if you're saying, you know, that, that flow state, mm. could, could you kind of, you know, at a quantum level maybe sort of create? The sort of prepare yourself for the experience by inducing a similar state? I mean, it's similar to meditation, right? Um, and I guess set, setting an intention depending on how you do it, could be a very self-focused thing though as well. It could be very much related to increasing default mode network activation and then you're going to obliterate it and then put it back together afterwards. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily think setting an intention would be associated with a decrease in default mode network activation. Um, but I do like that idea. I think that's it. I think that's really, you know, everything we know about psychedelics is that the amount of work you put in before uh, is going to lead to a more beneficial effect during the experience. You know, you can go take LSD at a festival just to party, which is fine, you can do that, but not necessarily going to have a peak experience when you do that. But if you put in a lot of work beforehand and use it with the intention of therapy, you're going to get a lot more out of it. So I think um, it would be interesting to see if there are any uh, related changes in the brain to that. Down the front. numbers in ours to do the formal analyses of different substances so we kind of locked in on these serotonergic psychedelics because if we did that we were able to combine the psilocybin and LSD and so I couldn't tell if there were fine-grained differences anecdotally online there is definitely people who talk about preferring different substances for different reasons and I also showed that chart where we had some other things like for example there were people microdosing on something like ketamine which I would imagine has very different effects to the more serotonergic substances and people might be using ketamine for example for specifically antidepressive qualities or something like that so I, I think that the, the studies that have mainly been done on microdosing so far have all looked at single substances and there hasn't been yet any really good cross substance comparison um, I think you said, is it just the day, is it predictably the day after or does it last longer, your rebound in the default mode network? Is it going to be a permanent effect if you keep taking it? So the changes are short lasting if you take it acutely. So a single dose, you'll have a rebound effect which may last up to a week um, or so. And I think that correlates a lot with what people ex have 
their own experiential knowledge when they take a psychedelic that afterglow effect doesn't last forever. Um, we haven't done repeated administration to see what happens with that and I think um, it's more about how you use that time period that's going to be important, how you use that that initial afterglow period and how you integrate your experience during that critical period when your brain is a bit more plastic, how are you going to use that period is going to be the important part. Down the front. Why do you people report uh, contacting or making contact with non human intelligence in psychedelic states? Um, a lot of what you've been talking about has to do with the perspective of pharmacological mechanisms of action and how that affects the brain and central nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, from the non human intelligence perspective, that's very much a experiential point of view on the changes that come from having that sort of communication. So I guess what my question is, is how do you reconcile those two different perspectives and means of understanding the experience? Well, I mean, that, that, those sort of things don't really come into the work on microdosing because the doses yeah. are so slow. Yeah. Um, but I guess just to try and say something about that in general, I mean, most of the scientific research on psychedelics doesn't pay much attention to those sorts of things. There is some work, for example, uh, Christopher Timmerman at um, Imperial College has been looking at DMT and reports of entity contact. And so, um, you know, there, there is data showing that that does happen at reliable kinds of levels. And of course, Rick Strassman was the first person to, to really look at that. But I think the, the main approach within cognitive science and the psychotherapeutic approaches to psychedelics has really been to not concentrate on that. I mean, those things really come up mainly with um, DMT family of substances and very high dose psilocybin. And a lot of the psychotherapeutic research isn't really using psilocybin at that level or isn't really using DMT. So, I mean, that's just so weird and strange that I think um, either it's going to be something that is too difficult for science to investigate or it's going to be something that has to come quite a bit later and certainly the, the predominant materialistic scientific perspective on that would be that the, these are imaginative experiences triggered by the drugs and they don't have an external reality but you know of course people who are really into these substances or into the, like a shamanic perspective have a very very different view on that. That's um, it's, it's super interesting because, as you said, it occurs primarily with DMT or high dose psilocybin, um, and I guess you know if we I, I, say, I saw a talk with Robin Carhart Harris, who is talking about bridging this divide between the spirituality of psychedelics and the science of psychedelics, and how do you do that? How do you go about researching subjects like entities? and still be scientific at the same time. It's a, it's a complex question, but it's something we need to do because it's some of, as we know, and I think this is uh, what's coming out of the Griffiths lab, you know, that they, they've been trying to do that. They've been trying to measure mystical experiences uh, and quantify it in a way that we can then go, okay, we can reliably induce mystical experiences using psilocybin and we know that's related to the therapeutic effect. I think it's just a matter of time until we start to get a bit more detailed into what we're looking at in terms of the effects. I mean, just to say one more thing on that quickly, the, the approach that science can take is, it's very difficult for science to approach an ontologically complex question like, are there DMT entities? But uh, data that science can approach is people's experiences and impressions. So if a study looks at people who take DMT and ask them to describe or rate their experiences in systematic and controlled ways, that's data that we can look at. And so that's the sort of thing that, that is being done and I think is, is the way into that. Um, yeah, down the front. Yeah, um, that's what well done on the study and it must have been hard to do this good. But um, did you have any quality data on the actual doses or was that just all subjective experience from the participants? No. And surely the next step would all say be a double line, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, we, we definitely asked people to report their doses, and I can't remember too many of the figures off the top of my head, but it was generally in line with what people report for microdosing. And we've got in the paper the specific amounts for the different substances. Of course, we have to, had to, in our study, rely on people's honesty and also accuracy in knowing the yeah. doses. 
And we did something interesting is we did also look to see whether um, you know, the, the doses influence the experiences that people were describing. We entered that as a variable in our analysis, essentially. And it actually didn't make too much difference whether people were you know, on the higher or the lower end of what they considered a microdose. People's experiences were, were more or less similar. And that does match with the way people talk about microdosing online. It's a lot of when, when people start microdosing, it seems like there's a period of sort of establishing the effective dose for each individual. And it does seem to vary quite a bit. So I don't think there's like a set to microdose, you must take exactly this amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. obviously, depending on body mass. For sure, yeah. But, um, does if you do microdose, does that um, then diminish the effect if you take a full dose? You know, like do you think you get like a <coughs> yeah. I don't know of any like formal tests of that, but it seems like the doses that people take on microdoses are so low that it wouldn't have too much of an effect. The only unknown there is that usually when people take psychedelics, they won't do it that often. Even people who are really into psychedelics might only do it a few times a year. So we don't really know too much about what happens when people are having this very chronic low level kind of use. It's still a bit unknown. Um. <laughs> There was someone over here that's been waiting for a while. Yep. We've had a lot of uh, positive information about psychedelics. Um, I'm just interested in there any negative or ill effects from uh, psychedelics taking too much of them? Do you have a study for you um, I mean, we've heard plenty of those for decades. Uh, but yeah, there are, definitely. Uh, and I think you bring up a very crucial point here where we have to be careful to be accurate in our reporting. Um, because it was being, it was overplaying the beneficial effects in the 60s that brought us to the sort of counterculture movement, which uh, probably was a little bit hazardous on maintaining psychedelics within a sort of functional level in society. So I think um, we have to be very critical in how we look at the research, how we do the research, and, and about reporting it accurately. We are talking about the beneficial effects today uh, in terms of the negative effects I guess there's been plenty of case reports of people or, or maybe HPPD or hallucinogen perceptual persisting disorder um, that occur in some people where it sort of induces an ongoing psychotic like state in people or a sort of flashback like traumatic uh, experience in some people and we all know from personal self reports and from hearing other people that have used it in a context where they haven't properly prepared themselves or maybe were naive to what the experience might be, having traumatic like effects as well. And I've seen this in people that I've worked with personally where this has been the case. So they're not substances for everyone. They very much have to be done with intention um, and being aware of what the effects are likely to be. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that's also the case with microdosing. We said. We, we certainly had some people in our study who... <laughs> that was interesting. We certainly had some people in our study who didn't like microdosing, who tried it a few times and then didn't want to continue. Um, not everyone had the same experiences as what, you know, the graphs I showed there. Some people found that it didn't improve their um, concentration, that it did, you know, that they really didn't like taking it at work or it made them feel uncomfortable. So the majority seemed to find it positive, but definitely not everyone. And that's similar. One of the papers I flicked up at the end is Jim Fadiman's paper that he's just published. And he also reports, I think, about 15 or 20 percent of people who sent him reports also didn't have um, you know, positive experiences. So we've got about 25 minutes until we want to start uh, showing the sunshine makers. So maybe if there are any people that really want to go get a drink or have a smoke or something to eat, um, it might be a good time, but I'm sure Vince and I are probably happy to stick around and answer questions if you want to stick here as well. Um, so, yep. Uh, I just wanted to ask, with all the prevalence of research coming out of the therapeutic benefits of psychosis, anxiety, and depression, and just general well-being, where do you think we'll be in 20 years? Uh, in our, uh, so that, like, the medical administration is going to so I might just repeat that one. So where do you think we will be in 20 years with psychedelics 
given the current use of them to treat anxiety, depression, and their current sort of renaissance in psychedelia for therapeutic reasons? Yep. Um, that's a pretty big question. I think so many people have different opinions on this. There's the ideal world, and then there's what's the likely world. I think within Australia, we generally are going to follow suit with what the United States are doing. So they tend to be the for the United States and Europe. They tend to be the forefront in conducting research uh, to doing these studies, and we're only just now, you know, a decade or two behind, starting to do our own. So our laws will probably follow what are happening there. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Denver are actually having um, a vote to decriminalise psilocybin. Um, so it might actually be the first place in the United States to decriminalise a psychedelic substance for personal use as well. Um, and, you know, if this continues down, just like cannabis has occurred, it, it, I believe within 20 years we'll be at least at the decriminalisation phase for psychedelics, um, if not starting to look at legalisation in a, in a way that's going to primarily be focused on medical use. That's my idea. I, I'm sure Vince has a different take. I mean, it seems like we're just a couple of years away from MDMA being a prescribable medicine for PTSD. That, that seems almost certain in the US that that will occur within a couple of years. So I think in 20 years, it's extremely likely that these substances will have medical use. It's much more unknown what form that's going to take. So there's a lot of concern now around sort of the um, you know medicalization and corporatization of psychedelic medicines, um, and I think that's a really important conversation. And then I think is something that is key for us to look at now that will determine what things will be like in 20 years. I don't have really good answers about what it's like, but again, I think. Um, you know, I'm a really big fan of David Nichols, who's speaking next month, who's, who's really into the kind of critique of some of the dangers of where that could go. And I think, yeah, the next event might have some answers for that, maybe. I mean, do you, do you know anything like that? Are people writing about that? Or? Yeah, I mean, that's really connected to what I was just talking about now. There is this kind of um, brewing tension, I guess, around that question. Who's going to be able to administer these these substances? I don't know in, in great detail, but I think the MAPS model for PTSD is that there will be licensed therapists who must have, do, who must have done their training, who will be the only ones allowed to prescribe um, MDMA for, for PTSD. Um, and that sounds great as long as the people giving out those licenses are people that are you know <laughs> working with with good morals and good ethics so yeah it, it's a really tricky question because you if if all the data really is substantiated and these substances work in the way that they do it does seem like these should be available as medicines but these are powerful substances and so you, you do need to think about what is the best model for it and um, yeah, I, I don't know. What, it's it's really tough one. What the answer to that is? I have two questions. Um, one is related to um, borderline personality disorder. I read somewhere where it's not advised to administer um, psychoactive drugs to someone who suffers from borderline personality disorder. Do you do you have any opinion or research on, on that? I, I don't know anything specific about that. I mean. Most of the research being done on psychedelics does screen participants very carefully, and so, um, you know, it, although it's been used for things like trauma and PTSD and depression and anxiety, I don't know of any work that's looking at anything sort of related to psychosis or anything like that. So, um, um, borderline personality disorder is another one that I, I just don't know if there has been research or, or not. Do you know anything about it? Does marijuana negate the effects of microdosing? Um, I don't know. It, it might be. I mean, so the, it's a tricky kind of question because, you know, the party line for from most microdoses is if you microdose, then you're not feeling any immediate effects. I'm a little bit skeptical of that. I kind of think that microdoses do feel a little something. It's definitely not the effect of a, a full recreational dose or not. If someone is taking a lot of cannabis, marijuana, that might change their sensitivity to what's happening, but yeah, it's, it's not something that, as far as I know, has been looked at. 
And how are uh, institutions getting around the current draconian laws? I mean, obviously they're realizing that this is the big new thing to be on board with, but uh, laws are really restricting how people can get access to these substances, administer them. How are, how are institutions going to move forward with the situation as it is? Um, I mean, there's certainly promising signs that people are just going through the bureaucratic processes and applying for licenses, like what's happening in Melbourne. You know, like there, there, there are mechanisms by which research can be done on those substances. It's just really tricky, and it can take a lot of build up and resources to get those sorts of things going. So one thing that's happening is just people are more prepared to go through that as this research is becoming more common and it is understood more. It's not as unusual for maybe some of the ethics boards or the senior executives in a university to, to back these kinds of projects. So I think that will continue to change. And then there's also this kind of separate stream of people looking at creative ways of doing this study. So, you know, we, we came up with this anonymous emailing system where we could recruit people without knowing who they were and get the regular information there. That's a pretty simple example. There's also the study I flicked up of people trying to study microdosing by, by looking at microdosing videos online. Um, something else um, me and some of my colleagues have done in research on psychedelics has been analysing Arrowhead trip reports and looking at quantitative methods of um, language analysis and corpus analysis. So there are, there are some kind of outside of the box approaches you can take to understanding these phenomena, but in general, it does seem like there is a, a change in how difficult and unusual it is to study, and I think that's, that's happening for the better. And there have been studies into um, DMT and PTSD and PTSD. I don't know of any. Um, there's, there's not, so nothing looking at PTSD with DMT. Uh, there was a recent study published, which was a preclinical study, which looked at DMT microdoses, uh, which seemed to change, seemed to be more beneficial than having a flood dose. But obviously, yeah, but that was that was done in rats. So that uh, it's pretty uh, measuring depression in rats. You know, I did it for four years. It's not. I still don't believe that I was actually measuring depression. Um, so um, hence why I'm now a psychologist. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, you've... Yeah, um, I was wondering what happens if you follow a mode network and sensory data like a sleep. The context is being how this microdose affects sleep. Is this being a resurgence and sleep studies as well? Um, I can talk a little bit, I don't know about default mode network and sleep. I know a little bit about sensory gating and sleep. Um, so within the midbrain, we actually have some of the areas which are producing the hormones related to what is occurring within our dream. And so there's actually, we're still having the same areas which project to the cortex information, which makes whatever you're, like say for instance in REM or when you're dreaming, um, you're still perceiving information in the same way and there is this increase of unfiltered information being projected up there but you're actually cutting it off at the brainstem so it's not coming back down. Uh, so basically that way when you're actually dreaming you, you don't respond to whatever stimuli is in your dream by you know running across the room away from the tiger or whatever it is that's chasing you. Um, so that's, that's about as much as I know about sensory gating and sleep itself, uh, uh, but in terms of the default mode network, I have no idea. So with, with sleep, do you have entropy here? I really don't know enough about those states to, to talk on them, sorry. Uh, who's had the hand up for the longest? I think you. Has there been a notice of a downtime the beneficial effects of microdosing after multiple cycles? Um, that's another really good question. Does it persist or not? So just based on some of our data, we definitely had a really large range in um, time microdosing. Some of our participants were um, very new to it, whereas others had been doing it for quite some time. And based on our numbers, there wasn't much difference between the really experienced and the, the very novice microdoses. But I think it's certainly something that needs to be looked at more. Anecdotally, just talking to people and getting reports, I get the sense that not too many people microdose very regularly for very long periods of time. There are certainly people out there that do it, but the general sense from conversations and reports that, that I've had is that people might do it for a month or a couple of months 
take a few months off and then do it again like that. It seems like there's more. Do you think that's because they're getting less effects so? though? I really don't know the reason it could be. I mean, probably if it, if, it, if it was continually improving, you wouldn't expect so many people to do it in that phased kind of way. Patients in clinical setting, like patients that would have, uh, we would assume the hypothesis would be that they would benefit from um, psychedelic therapy for anxiety, depression. Um, we're not at my university. Um, in terms of microdosing, James Spaderman is particularly interested in that, so most of the reports that he collects are from people who are using microdosing for more psychotherapeutic sorts of reasons, so his paper that's just come out is, is much more about that. Um, the only kind of clinical psychedelic work in Australia is this study that's just starting in, in Melbourne, it's the, the only yeah, thing really going on so yeah, far. I understand that the, obviously that would be the most compelling need for people that are towards their end of life and obviously they, but also to the living. We also sure, sure, sure. No, I mean, the, the lack of research isn't from an insensitivity to the need, it's from the difficulties around doing research, you know, like, um, yeah, I, I pushed back against in our personal study of, on the requirement of not being able to recruit people who have a history of mental illness because that, you know, that's so many people, <laughs> but it, that's just the way that... The, our, eth our ethics committee anyway saw this as like, you know, this is potentially a dangerous thing. You can only do it in the most safe of circumstances. But really, there's loads of anecdotal evidence where people who have anxiety and depression say microdosing helps. And that was the results we found even in a sample with very low levels of baseline anxiety and stress. So, yeah. Last question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was really interested in Yeah, for sure. I mean, the placebo effect is still an effect, definitely. And then how does that intersect with the psychedelic state in order to reduce Well, I mean, one way to think about that is traditionally one of the main ways that psychedelics are used is in ritual and ceremony, and a, a huge um, uh, effect of ritual is that it develops a kind of response set or people having very strong expectations. And even when you talk about, um, you know, dose set and setting, part of the, the set there is also deliberately managing your expectations. People often with psychedelics talk a lot about having an intention that's like 100% you deliberately saying, I'm going to set this expectation for myself and then seek to find it. And I think all of those things are as much a part of the experience as each other. It's not just the substance doing it. And so, you know, I, I think it is important to try and work out if there is anything beyond just the placebo effect in something like microdosing, and our results indicate there is. But I think you can also definitely use those kinds of expectations and um, intentions as a, a really beneficial part of the experience. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're going to go have at least another 10, 15 minutes and then bang you back in here for Sunshine Makers. Thanks, Vince. Pleasure. Cheers.